Bum, bum, ba, ba, bum, bum, ba, ba, bum, bum, ba, ba, bum. You know you could sing it yourself and then you don't get dinged on copyright. Maybe. Game of Thrones is incredible. It's amazing. I love all the characters and the intrigue and the plot twists and how no single story or person is too precious and could just be killed at any time. I actually really like that. My first episode that I ever watched, it was at the end of season one. I remember because I walked in, my roommates were watching it on the TV and I was like, what the heck is this? And they were like, oh, okay, you can't watch now because, and I was like, I get it. Dragon Lady, she's important. I don't know, whatever. Just let me watch. I was hooked. Immediately. Next thing you know, I watched all the episodes, read all the books, read the nerdy blogs. I even got the supplemental book about the history of Game of Thrones and the Seven Kingdoms from the library recently. And actually, I'm sort of just realizing now that I did a whole talk about how Dothraki could be a real language. <laughs> and yeah, it was, wow. As a sava ana ashina teholat. But aside from the dragons, the magic white trees, the slipping into other people's bodies and the super cold zombies, there's always been this one thing that just, you know, bothered me about the security concerns of the Seven Kingdoms, and that is the wall. These humans seem to be great at building castles and ships and swords and potions and stuff. This isn't just any old wall we're talking about. It's 213 meters tall, 500 kilometers long. It's 91 meters thick. It's like a skyscraper that is as long as the Grand Canyon. So we veered strongly into fantasy with the wall from page one. Uh, actually, the wall didn't yeah. appear okay, till page yeah. 19. Sure, sure, sure. Page 19, got it. Anyway, I wanted to know the feasibility of this giant wall of ice. Could we build this? I can crush ice between my teeth, so can ice actually hold that kind of weight? I found some experts who know a bit about glaciers and ice sculptures and construction, and I put them all together for this episode of Hello Science. So let's see if we can take this amazing architecture out of fantasy and bring it into some fact, shall we? Welcome, people of the North and all of the Seven Kingdoms. Have some bread and salt and share my table. To the North loomed the wall. Almost 700 feet high it stood, three times the height of the tallest tower in the stronghold it sheltered. His uncle said the top was wide enough for a dozen armored knights to ride abreast. The wall is massive, and its whole job is to keep the Night King out of Westeros. Well, what was that, a spoiler? It's been two years. Come on. I guess it just, you know, didn't work. But regardless of what actually happened to the wall or will happen to the wall, building giant things like that is entrancing, right? So if I remember correctly from Geometry Plus My 2006 Tour of Egypt, what we need is a slope, a bunch of giant bricks and a large supply of cheap labor. But before we can construct really anything anywhere at any time in history, even the Great Pyramids, what we really need is an engineer to make a plan. I think there are two main stages to construction. There's the pre-construction part where all of the drawings need to be created. And so engineers have to take into consideration where the building is going to be built, what it's built upon, what conditions it's going to encounter while it's there, and take into consideration all of those things so they can come up with a design. So really thinking through everything that is going to impact the structure over time. My name is Mara Sudis. I am an engineer and project manager, and my favorite Game of Thrones character is Masande. She like came from nothing. She proved her own way. She's gorgeous. I love her outfits. She's top notch. She's my favorite. <laughs> so for perspective, this is what we're gonna build. It's the wall. It's about the same height as San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, and as wide as three of them. Whoa. I know. I asked Mara what it would take to build something as massive as a 213 meter tall wall. Once you have the design and everything is finalized, then comes the idea of how are we actually going to do this? Are you going to go from right to left or start in the middle? And why would you need to do something different? If you think ancient Egypt, how are they building things that tall? They needed that pyramid shape to move the material to the top. They're gonna have to move that material manually up to the top of the wall. Now we can use a crane and we can take a crane and move material to the top. But if you're talking Game of Thrones time, they're gonna have to create some kind of pyramid shape, at least, you know, some kind of slope to move the material up. Even when I have construction drawings that are 100% approved, I go in and I have to test for compaction in soil and other existing conditions. And so that can you know, change everything that they design for if what we actually have is different. You have all of these people who have looked at drawings, who have thought of things, and then we get there and we say, wait, we can't open this door because this is there. The wall is big. 
It's heavy, and like any building, it has to sit on the surface of the earth in some way that is safe. You wouldn't want to build the wall and have it sink into the soil and fall over due to high winds or anything like that. We're not even going to consider the fact that catapulting rocks from the top of the wall would put a huge amount of shearing stress on the wall thanks to Newton's laws, but think about the physical structure itself instead. Like, what is underneath the wall? Ice? On the coasts, there's definitely a beach, so is it sand? What's under the sand and what's under the ice? I mean, maybe the sand has a really good bedrock or foundation underneath that you can drill into, and maybe the ice is ice for a really long time and there's nothing solid, or maybe it moves more. I don't know. This is a fictional world. We don't know. We don't know what we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> they could have different laws of physics. We don't know. We don't know. There is magic. As a general rule, the taller the building is, the deeper its foundation must be. The mass of the wall would definitely require some ridiculous foundations. In the early years of skyscraper construction, engineers realized that they needed to dig foundations of these big heavy buildings deeper than topsoil to keep the building from falling over or sinking. So what they did is they learned to sink what are called piles into the ground below the foundation. Piles are wood or cement or steel poles, essentially. If they couldn't do that, they just had to keep digging until they got to bedrock, because that's stable. For something like the Empire State Building, for example, there are 210 piles driven more than a dozen meters into the rock and soil of the island of Manhattan, and that's what keeps the building upright and stable. And Bran the Builder would also have to consider the mass of the wall. Skyscrapers aren't solid, they're hollow just a skin of glass or brick over a steel skeleton. The square cube law says, generally speaking, the volume of a thing grows much faster than its surface area. And so to build the wall, you'd have to move a lot of material, like eight swimming pools of water ice for every meter of wall constructed. The logistics of getting so much material into one place uh, exhausts me <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> ice is so heavy that you can't pile too much on a small base or it will fracture or break with the increased weight. A cubic meter of ice is actually 2,026 pounds. And this would be a factor with building an enormous wall. That means a uh, one meter wide, 213 meter tall section of the wall would weigh 17.8 million kilograms. That's Rex, by the way. He is my version of Bran the Builder. Hi, I'm Rex Covington and I'm an uh, ice sculptor here in Los Angeles. You know, I don't watch Game of Thrones uh, religiously, but I've seen many episodes and I've definitely seen the ice wall and some of the good episodes with the dragons and stuff. Rex knows ice. He's been working with it for decades. He knows how to make it, to build with it, to chop it up and to turn it into everything from, say, a rearing horse or an eight foot tall person to an entire ice wall complete with fully stocked bar. He's my kind of guy. If there's any degree of radius or curvature to the wall, then it would certainly stand without question and be less likely to fall over. So if it were 300 miles long and there was some curvature to it, it, likely it would stand. You need a large enough footprint to support the weight. Just talking about real life, not with magic, so. <laughs> but magic could help. If the base is big enough, it really can support an unbelievably large amount of weight, like a glacier. That's right, think of the wall not as a skyscraper, says Rex, but as a glacier. A 500 kilometer long, 200 meter high mass of ice cutting through the landscape of the north and ending in the sea uh, on both ends. I mean, those dimensions remind me a little bit of the Jakobshavn Glacier, which is a glacier in Greenland, and it's where the iceberg fell off that they think sunk the Titanic. That's Mary Miller. I figured since we're talking glaciers, you know, why not bring in someone who's seen her fair share? I'm Mary Miller. I'm the um, director of environmental science here at the Explorator. My favorite thing about Game of Thrones is the dragons, of course. But my mother-in-law is a huge fan, so she is going to be so super excited <laughs> on a video about Game of Thrones. <laughs> in order to actually build something that's like the wall of ice, uh, it, it would take a lot of work. I mean, nature builds walls of ice. They're called glaciers. Mary also has experience building her own walls of ice while on research trips in Antarctica. Building a small wall was a lot of work. It took about five of us three or four hours to cut chunks of ice out of the snow and then just build a wall um, and pitch our tent on the other side of it. But some people actually got really got into it and they built igloos and snow caves and you know just loved 
playing around with the snow, but I was exhausted. Glaciers are like nature's versions of the wall, but they're built over thousands upon thousands of years. A glacier uses falling snow to build on the top, and then the weight compresses the snow below it, and that eventually makes ice. I'll let Mary explain it. If you cross-sectioned a glacier from the top to the bottom, the top would be sort of more fluffy white snow. Um, as you get farther down, it gets the compaction of the snow forces most of the air out or into really small bubbles. So then you see a much more more sort of clear or blue color with little bubbles in it um, all the way to the bottom when you might see a little film of water on the bottom. And that water is important because though glaciers do seem solid to us, you know, on human scales, they're actually not at all. I think people look at these big ice sheets and glaciers as being extremely stable, but they're very dynamic. Anything that big and massive wants to spread out. A famous glaciologist, Richard Alley, told me that glaciers are like pancakes. When you pour pancake batter on a griddle, it wants to spread out under its own weight. And if you pour enough of it, it'll fall off the edge of your griddle, um, which is what happens when glaciers calve off. And you probably have seen these big icebergs falling off glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica. That's what happens is that the glacier is moving, it reaches the edge, and gravity just takes it off the edge. So it would seem we'll never be able to actually build something like this out of ice, at least using traditional building materials. Even though it might be strong enough to hold up its own mass, the soil might not be stable enough, we'd need a surveyor to find out. And on Earth, ice melts under pressure, which is part of the reason glaciers flow across the landscape, and the wall would likely bow out at the bottom. So let's instead just assume that we had the perfect conditions, and the magic is what's helping hold it up. So according to our experts, this is what we would need to build the wall. So um, when we built our survival wall, or our ice wall in Antarctica, we just dug the ice blocks out of snow that was there that had compacted over time. I, I, I imagine that you probably could make a mold and pour water into it. What if you made forms like you do with concrete, but instead of pumping up concrete, you pump up water? It would probably be really clear ice if you had to pump up like boiling water and because boiling water makes clearer ice and you make a block of ice at the top of the wall and you just let it freeze and you just let it freeze in the existing cold conditions it's very very cold it's a lot more brittle and that's not what we want so we temper it and it softens and then we sculpt it when ice is connected together when the mass of the ice itself is greater it actually melts slower because it keeps itself cold the outer edge is melt but the interior should doesn't so piece it together by searing each plate and connecting them together sort of like how you would build a wall it really is a man-made glacier over time it would want to spread out so in order to sort of keep it stable i would think you'd have to put some support structures you know like those buttresses in old cathedrals to kind of keep it in place yeah. but it's a magical wall so you know anything is possible uh well if i had infinite money and resources, like an infinite supply of ice. If you take away all the limitations in that regard and you have the proper tools to move that kind of weight in pieces, um, I don't see why you couldn't build almost anything. We can, we can build the wall any way that they want us to as long as we have a stamped set of engineering plans yeah. because that's the most important thing to have. If the engineer stamps it, I'll build it. So with a little bit of magic, there you have it, Georgie Martan. Science seemingly can find answers for almost everything, although in this case, not for magic. But if you're thinking magically enough, there are 17 different types of water ice that we know of in our universe. Ice, as we you know, put it in our drinks and stuff, that's just ice one. When water freezes, those little bent H2O molecules form into lattices, and maybe just maybe, one of those lattices is stronger than regular old ice. We can't actually make them outside of a laboratory or another planet. But there are hundreds of possible configurations on our planet and elsewhere in the universe. So what if the children of the forest made the wall out of some other type of water ice? That would seem like magic, even to today's scientists and it would still fall within the realm of the laws of physics. While talking to these experts about building a giant wall of ice, I sort of started getting parallels to climate change. We're losing ice in massive quantities around our planet right now. And if you think of the wall of ice as the ice on our planet and the dragon as climate change, you would never think that all that ice would disappear or cause the destruction of all mankind until it happens. There was a recent study um that just came out of 
are looking at 19,000 glaciers all around the world. So these are glaciers on mountains as well as in polar regions. And they're melting five times faster than they were in the 1960s. When you melt ice you, and you warm those regions, you really disrupt the whole climate system on Earth. Not only is it getting warmer everywhere, but the ice itself um, disappearing is making bigger swings in weather than, than we've had before. I hope that you agree that Game of Thrones is a wonderful piece of art and a thoroughly enjoyable fantasy fiction, and while it does seem to be rooted in some semblance of physical reality, there is a lot more magic and mystery in the pages of this world without dragons or zombies. The sheer scale of the wall just helps transport us to a fantastical world where people are capable of doing incredible things even if they can't form a stable government. I hope that season eight ends on a high note because, it, oh my God, please tell me what you think is gonna happen in the comments. This episode is brought to y'all by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. If you want to know more about ice on our planet, you should watch Expedition Antarctica because you get seals and penguins and ice and no zombies or dragons. It's perfect. Joining is simple and you get a freebie. Just go to curiositystream.com slash trace, enter the promo code trace, and you'll get the first 30 days completely free. Plus, you get to try the service for free and you support the show. It's a win-win, go do it. Thanks so much for watching Uno Dose of Trace and Hello Science. If you have ideas for future episodes, please let me know down in the comments. Make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you click the little bell so you get new episodes every week. This episode was made with the help of all of our patrons. Thank you guys and thank you for watching. So while the giant wall of ice that we see and read about in Game of Thrones wouldn't actually be possible with engineering that doesn't involve magic, it is still a lot of fun to think about. So again, thanks for watching. I'm Trace and I'll see you in the future. Oh, Game of Thrones season eight. Bum, 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 bum. But if I had to live anywhere in Game of Thrones, I would definitely live in Dorne because it's beautiful there. <laughs> Long flowing outfits and wine and snacks and sign me up. <laughs> I like the snacks. I don't know what snacks they have, but I'm ready for them.